Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sandy Carhill, and I am the chairman of the club. Before introducing our guest, Kate Ady, let me thank, uh, on behalf of all of us here tonight, Vanessa and Peter Davis. Um, it is their keen interest and deep passion they have taken the lead in the club's commemorations of the 100th anniversary of World War I, and that includes tonight's top billing. Thank you, Vanessa and Peter. I do not need to remind you of the fact that we now find no surprise in receiving news from a woman at the front line. And that is in no small part due to Kate. She was indeed one of a handful of distinguished female journalists who helped break that glass ceiling. She has won numerous awards from the Royal Television Society, the Broadcasting Press Guild, and the prestigious Richard Dimbleby BAFTA. She was awarded the OBE in 1993. My vision of Kate is on that front line, in the flak jacket, broadcasting major reports from such places as Tiananmen Square, the Gulf War, and Yugoslavia. Where there was danger, there was Kate. She was the BBC's chief news correspondent for 14 years. She is now a freelance journalist, presenter from our own correspondent on Radio 4, and writer. Even this morning, she was broadcasting an appeal for the dreadful events in Nepal. But let me take you back to Kate's big public break. She was first on the scene at the storming of the Iranian embassy and she had to busk it live to a very large TV audience from behind a car door. Was she scared? I know somebody who was. The World Snooker Championships were being transmitted at the time. Back at the BBC television centre, the duty network director was basking in the calm of a nice long transmission slot. Suddenly, instruction came to interrupt the programme for a news report. It was 1980, long before 24-hour news. This meant incurring the wrath of millions of snooker fans <laughs> by cutting away to some journalist crouching behind a car door in London because a whole load of terrorists had occupied the Iranian embassy. The network director's carefully worked out schedule had just been torn up. She had absolutely no idea of what would happen next. That's scary. And the network director under stress? Me. <laughs> But we ladies are made of sterner stuff. Yes. <laughs> and Kate has never let us forget that in her writing. We are privileged to have her here with us this evening to remind us through her most recent book of the legacy we owe to those women from all works of life who came before us in World War I. Ladies and gentlemen, Kate Ady. Thank you, thank you so much for such a lovely introduction. Um, it, it, it brings to mind, because I am talking about uh, the ladies in World War I, that when I face an audience, not all of them are aware that um, uh, my broadcasting career, uh, what the duration of it uh, was. I mean, you heard a great uh, a, a list of some of the stories, which I was very lucky and privileged to do. But, uh, I recognized, though, in front of me an informed and 
wise audience. <laughs> um, I, I faced some students when I first started talking about this book and thought I had the answers to most questions they might throw at me, but was slightly, slightly put off balance by a student standing up at the end of my talk and saying, well, well, one, well, what was it like for you? <laughs> So I go carefully about people's memories and such like and the amount of their historic knowledge. I think there's a very good question to be asked by anybody of me as to why have I actually added to the enormous great heap of books about World War I. And it does very much uh, connect to um, my life in journalism as a TV reporter. Uh, not that I was someone who uh, stood as a small child and thought about actually being a reporter. To be perfectly candid, I come from that generation. Maybe there are some kindred spirits here where I went to a nice girls' school where really your entire intention in life was to uh, not be too clever, dear, and marry a nice man. Um, therefore, when it came to ideas of career, there was very little. And I learned when I was looking into not only uh, the background for this book, but also when I wrote a book about women in uniform through the last century or so, um, I realized that the two world wars had a phenomenal impact, which is, if you didn't experience it, it's extremely difficult to conceive nowadays, particularly after we've had 70, almost 70 years of peace. And after both of those world wars, the role of women, uh, which had blossomed in those world wars because of necessity, with women expanding their horizons or being told to by the government in order to take part in the war effort. At the end of both of those wars, there was an immediate reaction that the women should return to the kitchen, because the men were coming home and the jobs were to be opened for them. Um, I therefore was a child of the generation which had been shunted out of its more expanded and perhaps more exciting role in World War II. And I always thought that it was perhaps maybe just that the women said they wanted to go back to work in 1992 to the home in 1919, 1945, until I came across the Imperial War Museum's wonderful collection of posters and marvelous records of the time. And there's a wonderful poster from 1945, which pretty well sums up the position of women after World War II. And it's a very elegant woman in a nipped in waist and a little frilly petticoat. She's beautifully coiffed is she has um, just a certain amount of makeup on, nothing too forward, dear, this is 1945. <laughs> and she is standing in the poster in front of clearly a sparklingly clear house, and there is a little pot bubbling on the hob. <laughs> the rubric of the poster reads, make it a home fit for him to come home to. <laughs> that was a government campaign. So I am a child of the women who had reluctantly very much to return to what was seen as the ideal life, the domestic life. And therefore, I grew up with my peers not really thinking about any kind of career at all. And um, to cut a very long story short, um, my A-levels were um, described, I think, officially as rubbish. And in desperation, I had an ambitious headmistress was determined that at least one girl should go into university. Um, the rest, you know, we were all playing tennis. <laughs> you know, pursuing the right things in life, tennis and boys. And there we were um, with these terrible results. And so she decided at least one girl should go on the entrance board. So she picked me. Uh, not, I don't think, for intellectual brightness, but my name begins with A, and I was top of the <laughs> register. There you go. I went, I went into university um, in, in a, a method I can only describe as via the cat flap. Um, 
And therefore, having been wheedled in by the headmistress's phone call, call no less, I, I found myself studying for the next few years on a course which was one of the less subscribed subjects. And I know there are some pretty exotic ones around today at universities, uh, but I, I still very rarely meet anyone who has a degree in Swedish and Old Icelandic. <laughs> My professor, bless him, was a wonderful and inspiring man. He was also an immense optimist, and he said in my final year, when I was beginning to wonder what I should do, um, he, he said to me, Miss Hedy, never, never give up. I predict you will become a national treasure, should the Vikings ever invade again. <laughs> So, armed with a not particularly useful degree, I was lucky. There is a certain amount of luck in life, I'm sure of that. And I coincided my exit from university with the BBC um, starting on an experiment, an experiment in local radio. It shows you how far back this was. And we were still doing things like you know, the rather serious home service. Are you sitting comfortably? Let me begin. And local radio was a small revolution in the BBC. It was the BBC getting back to grassroots. And very much towards the end of the 60s, early 70s, there was this idea that radio should be much more about other people's voices rather than the broadcasters talking to the audience. It should be the voices of the community. And so I found myself brought up in the Northeast, I'm a wearsider, and I found myself applying for the local station, which was going to be number eight of the experimental stations in Durham. And I had no idea what I would be doing. In fact, it is still somewhere in the BBC's records, or what they, um, you know, when they've got the dirt on you, they keep it. And there it is written. When Miss Aidy was asked in her first interview what she was prepared to do, she replied, anything. <laughs> I was desperate for a job. I had no idea what I would be doing. I spent several years in local radio, and one major point from it, apart from the fact that life was chaotic and it was um, uh, full of the unexpected, uh, particularly for the good people of Durham, um, who did not know what local radio was. We spent a lot of time explaining ourselves, but we thought that we would come closer to them because we had a wonderful newfangled piece of equipment, the radio car. And they were going to come flocking to us to tell us their ideas, their thoughts, their complaints, whatever, the radio car. Well, it went out into the council house estates of Durham, and everybody rushed indoors and closed their doors because they thought <laughs> we were the TV licensed detector van. <laughs> um, it didn't help, actually, that we were the eighth station and hadn't been intended to be Durham. We were going to be Manchester initially, and then the good burghers of Manchester said no to the BBC, and so all the equipment and the car and everything came to Durham, and we drove it round. And painted gaily on the side in huge letters was, listen to your BBC local radio station. Radio Manchester crossed out Durham underneath. <laughs> Not good PR. The one thing I learned, though, in the midst of our youthful and extremely chaotic attempts to put a radio station together from scratch, was that the BBC had been right in one thing. When you want to broadcast, you want to hear the voices of people who know something or care about it. They are the magic things about good broadcasting. It isn't having a mellifluous voice or having being coached into be a broadcaster, or acting training, or being an important person. It's none of those. The important thing is to either know about something, or care about it, or with luck, both together. They are the voices which, when you're passing your radio, and you'll have all, I'm sure, done this, you suddenly stop, you've no idea what it's on about, and you hear a voice, and you pick it up, and you think, my goodness, and it's intense, and it cares, and it's speaking from the heart and the head. Wonderful broadcasting. And anyone can do that 
All they have to do is know about something, care about it, and you make wonderful broadcasters. I tell you that because the rest of my broadcasting career, as I moved eventually into television entirely by mistake, but there you go, that's the BBC for you, um, and I found myself in places like the Middle East, in Central Africa, um, in Bosnia, in the Gulf War. And the main thing was always to get a voice, many voices, from that story and the people who had experienced what was going on there, wherever we had travelled to. They were the best voices to put on air. Not mine. Mine just glued bits, bits together and gave a sort of background or a frame for the story. It's always the people who have the real experience. They're the ones who matter. They're the ones who deliver great broadcasting. Um, how does this connect into World War I? Well, I found myself going um, to conflicts. Not because, and let me disabuse um, uh, the general notion that there is such a person as a war correspondent. Uh, there is no such job. It's never advertised. I can only think that if it were, can you imagine what sort of person might turn up? <laughs> Standing in front of a BBC board and saying, I just love being shot at and lying in ditches. You know. There is no such job. It is to put it in a sort of a casual way, it comes with the turf. War, sadly, is part of lives and the lives on the planet. And broadcasting news is about the life of people on the planet. And therefore, war figures in your task as a journalist. And I never aimed to do that sort of thing. It just came along when I was first uh, a, a reporter. When I had the very first day of my reporter, I learned something of the kind of randomness of it and the fact that you didn't choose to go on assignments. You were sent. Fairly important thing, that. Time and again, I've been asked, what did you choose? You say the word choice. You're a mere reporter. Legs with a microphone attached. Got it? <laughs> or, as the camera man used to say, I'm the lens, the sound man's the lugs, you're the lips. <laughs> and you were sent. And on my very second day in the newsroom in London, being a fairly callow reporter with only a little bit of rather, um, uh, rather patchy experience as a regional television reporter, still not quite sure of myself. I went up in the lift into the newsroom in Shepherd's Bush uh, on the second day, first day being given an orientation in the place, which consisted of my then new colleague saying, the bar is that way. <laughs> um, and I got into the newsroom um, just after uh, eight o'clock in the morning on the early shift, and there was a small group of reporters there and there were far fewer specialists. So when I was queued up, as it were, there was two reporters ahead of, ahead of me going up to the news organizer's desk, and I was listening carefully. I was wondering how stories were assigned. And the news editor was sitting there, the news organizer, and was saying, not taking much notice, and saying, you, at the next body that appeared next to him. Go to Belfast, trouble again last night, more trouble this evening, get a plane. I, overhearing, went, oh, Belfast. I was a bit different to where I'd just come from, which was Brighton. <laughs> we didn't have many riots in Brighton. I thought, my goodness me, oh, gosh, Belfast. Next reporter. Ah. Oh. He said, foreign editor's been on. Foreign editor wants you. Where do you want, where's he going? You're going to Angola. Hope, I know, hope you know where it is. Right, go and get a jab and find a plane. <laughs> I edged nearer the desk. I was just full, partly of sort of excitement, but a bit apprehensive. And he looked at me and said, you? I said, is he, you the new one? I said, yes, 80. He said, oh, yeah. Mm. Crufts. <laughs> Life was like that in the newsroom, you didn't choose. 
I learned something, though, going to rather a lot of conflicts. I learned that what I'd learned in local radio was important, that you took everybody's voices and you took note of everyone. If you went to a conflict, you didn't just take pictures of and seek out people in uniform, usually men, and armed men at that. You didn't just talk to a general, a warlord, a fighter, a guerrilla. You looked at what you could see around you, as in Bosnia, as in so many places in the Middle East. And what you didn't see was a battlefield with two armies in uniform lined up against each other. No. Wars aren't fought like that anymore, if they ever were, to be honest. What you saw was villages, as you see on your televisions now, of rubble, of elderly people standing bewildered with none of their home left, with them gathering up bundles, lines of people heading they're not quite sure where, ending up in refugee camps. You see teenagers scampering through sniper-covered streets. That's war. And I was determined, I found, to cover all of that in the sense that it wasn't just military manoeuvres. It was what happened to people. It was who supported the war, who wished it had never happened, the people driven out of their homes, the people affected by matters such as the dreadful business of war. And in World War I, what we get to is pretty well the first time from a very long time since the civil wars and medieval skirmishes, we get pretty well the entire population of this country affected by war. And it fascinated me because you look at the thousands and thousands of titles about books about World War I, and the majority, and rightly so, are about the reasons we went to war, the politics, and also the way the war was fought. But behind all of that was the entire country, dragged in, whether it liked it or not, or enthusiastically supporting, but not on a front line. And indeed, during that war, the word front line was added to with the new phrase, the home front. It was the war that saw the start of the wars we are very familiar with today. Now, one of the things that happened was when that war was declared in August 1918 and 14, absolutely no woman had a part in it. No, dear. No, no, that's politics. Women don't do politics. Certainly not in 1914, where women had fewer rights in law. They had fewer social uh, rights in the sense that they weren't expected to take part much in public life. A few of the upper class had privileged positions that were forceful and quite well educated, but it was a handful of women compared to the majority. The majority were meant to stay confined entirely to a domestic role, which with the working class meant that you cleaned everything. The largest number of women in work were in domestic service on a pittance an absolute pittance. Middle class women did not work after they were married, and even then they weren't encouraged into the careers. The phrase, oh, I'm very worried about my daughter, she's going to be clever, you know. <laughs> there was a sense that this was not a good omen. And women were considered anyway to be physically frail. Nobody noticed the chambermaid carrying up buckets of uh, coal in the morning, but they were considered to be delicate. The Victorian ideas of women were still very much in evidence in 1914. There were few women in the professions. Just over 500 women were doctors. Um, You'd think that that would have been immensely satisfying for people aiming for the medical profession. Not at all. The male profession hated them. They wouldn't be allowed to be surgeons. In fact, as GPs, they only had women and children as patients. No man would think of taking off any article of clothing other than his hat <laughs> in front of a strange woman. 
maybe they were right in one way to be cautious, the um, men who did not go to women doctors, all of the men. And that is because during the anatomy lectures, it was very common for the women medical students who were frowned upon by most of the elderly lecturers at university and frequently barred women medical students from the lectures on anatomy involving the male figure from the waist downwards. <laughs> yes, well, it was a narrow life. And of course it was narrow because of some of the ideas which were conventional, traditional, and adhered to by both men and women, but to be seen perhaps in a very clear way in the number of times that the suffrage movement, which had been in existence fighting for over a decade to get the vote and not winning public popularity. They had supporters in many, many numbers, but the general public was none too happy with the idea and in 1913, just before war was declared, there was yet another debate in the House of Commons which pretty well encapsulated the view as to why women should not have the vote. When an MP got up and said, if women were given the vote, that would mean they would have to take decisions. <laughs> Serious decisions. As we all know, women have smaller brains. <laughs> and it is very, very likely, gentlemen, honourable members, that should they have to take serious decisions on matters of state, those brains will become overheated <laughs> and possibly boil. This was met not with laughter but with hear, hear around the house. That was the attitude and war is declared, decided on by men, to be fought by men and if the previous century was anything to go by, all of those imperial wars, it would be distant in a foreign country and, and so, so great was the conviction about this, it would be all over by Christmas. That phrase is still with us. So great was the conviction of this powerful imperial nation. The immediate effect of the declaration of war was the most phenomenal rush to the colours of tens of thousands of men from all walks of life and all around the country. Every drill hall, every town hall, every police station, every army base had men clamouring to sign up. It was an extraordinary, extraordinary atmosphere. Over the Channel, the Germans though, did not seem to be very ruffled by this. French army was tackling them and was suffering horrendous casualties which were not reported. They were in the hundreds of thousands. It didn't take a long time for the War Office in London to realise that for all these men who were signing up, there might be a need for even more. And the first sort of tremors that this war might be different were beginning to sort of be felt in the country. The way you communicated the government to the people was by the vast numbers of newspapers were published then, but the commonest way was by posters. There were little family firms in every village and town up and down the country. It was how you told people what was on at the cinema. Mind you, that was not for the middle classes. It was considered still in 1914 not proper for nice women to go and sit in the dark next to strangers. <laughs> but it was huge. It was growing in popularity. Um, posters announced the films. They announced markets in rural areas. They announced public uh, events in every town. And posters appeared in their millions when it came to the war effort. These were some of the first when they began to feel they needed a few more. This caused this little poster a bit of consternation. I mean, the first remark someone wrote in a letter to a national newspapers, oh, well, she may be proud of him, but it's not a woman's place to comment on the war or on 
least fighting matters, and they thought it rather improper. <laughs> Curiously, it was a harbinger of things to come. But this was even more. Guess who'd gone to sign up? The man who runs the poster firm. And the first signs began to appear all across the country that men had left jobs in a great excitement. Often the family firms, which were the bulk of all trade and business in this country, and um, the daughters, the wives and the sisters were beginning to have to go, oh, we might have to do a bit more, but it'll only be for a month or so. Do remember, it's all going to be over by Christmas. So initially there was a sense of, well, we'll fill in. And uh, there were also the beginnings of the general attitude to this. Slight apprehension, mm, not very proper for girls to go up ladders, though she's young, so she's allowed to show her ankles. Every proper lady has her skirt to the ground course the image of women was absolutely cast iron and um, there was a sense that uh, women were moving into for example the greengrocers where it was remarked in one of the magazines uh, mrs mrs welsh has been seen at the greengrocers now her husband is gallantly signed up as a soldier she was seen the other morning wrestling with the cash register this sort of patronising, gosh, the little ladies, you know, are faced with amazing tasks and, huh, well, we can only be sorry for them, uh, was absolutely rife. But across the country, women were having to take on different jobs. The middle class, to be candid, huge numbers of frustrated, bored, smart, intelligent, quite well-educated women were wondering what they could do. Uh, they were thinking that they might want to serve. Well, there was no suggestion that they fight. None whatsoever. But they wanted to do something useful. The one thing the middle class could do was organise charities. Welfare work was their job. There was virtually no welfare system in the country. The workhouse took those who really sank to their knees. And so they organised demonstrations. The suffrage movement was good at this. It had buried the hatchet in 24 hours with the government after the declaration of war, having fought it for so long. Mrs Pankhurst, Emmeline Pankhurst, got up and said with some prescience, what is the point of fighting for a vote if there's no country left to vote in? <laughs> Practical woman. And much, not all, but much of the suffrage movement, some were very determined pacifists, moved over and decided to say, we really ought to do something. So, up and down the country, within days, women were getting together, informal committees, social groups, and saying, what are we going to do? Uh, and welfare was the obvious point, because very few people had given much thought to the fact that men who'd gone away to soldier had very small allowances coming to their families. There was going to be hardship. It was recognised very early on by these women. Um, I also realised that nobody took notice of them anyway. The government was not interested in what they were doing. They were forming the every sort of committee that began with a W. The WEC, the W... Um, VC, then the Women's Voluntary Corps, the Women's Emergency Council, the Women's Auxiliary Corps. They were popping up everywhere. They were good networkers, these women. A lot had been in the suffrage movement. They also, and this is the point, thought they should be taken notice of, and the people who were being taken notice of were wearing uniform. So they invented their own. Rather obviously. Sort of... Um, Half a man's uniform, a jacket, and then a nice, sensible skirt. <laughs> Nothing too daring. We don't want to scare the horses. The point about this picture, believe it or not, there is a historically important point in this picture. These women are wearing my school hat. <laughs> women in 1914, of these means, went out with a fruit salad and a dead pheasant on top of them. <laughs> Marvellous Edwardian confections. These women wished to be taken seriously and thought to be very, very disciplined. This was taken up after the war by almost every headmistress in the country. Girls would not be frivolous, 
girls would look serious. And this is the origin of that ghastly thing <laughs> which we had plonked on our heads for decades to come. A small point, but one that does indicate that image is changing slightly. And that is a very odd thing, that the war should be having this kind of effect. There's another sort of effect as well. The country was very early into its first moral panic. This is a place full of propriety, full of disapproval of women who do things which we do not approve of. And, of course, it was noted very quickly that at the ports and the army camps and the various barracks around the country, there were now thousands and thousands of men being <laughs> given um, uh, health checks, being kitted out and given rudimentary training. It was written to the Times in London. It is noticeable that these large gatherings of men are attracting large numbers of women. <laughs> Prostitution was an inevitability in a society which had widespread dire poverty. Um, prostitution, by the way, was entirely and utterly confined to women. Men appeared to have nothing to do with it whatsoever. <laughs> that was the view of the law and the police. So they used to target women. Men, well, nothing to do with it. No, 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 no. Um, so, for the first time ever, two groups of women went onto the streets entirely voluntarily. This is a posed photograph. Constables did not talk to them. They thought this was ludicrous. These are the first lady police. And their main aim was to do something about the problem at the great big camps. They were more interested, a lot of them had been in the suffrage movement and they felt very strongly Several of them, including one of their leaders, Evelina Haverfield, had been in uh, prison before for suffrage protests, and they were well aware that women were treated very, very badly. Men didn't like dealing with women who were, what was their phrase, out of control. And so they got themselves uniforms, even more severe hats, and they patrolled. It was written in many a paper that they spend an inordinate amount of time in the public parks, patrolling with long sticks, poking the bushes. <laughs> Propriety was everything. This was beginning to give the country a really sort of creepy feel that life was changing. Life was not as it should be. The war was meant to be like all previous wars for a hundred years fought a long way away and not really affect those people at home. There was deep unease. Jobs were changing, women were having to undertake new tasks, nobody was quite sure what was coming, and Christmas was approaching when this happened. At eight o'clock in the morning, the good people of Scarborough sat down to breakfast and two battleships, German battleships, opened up on them. 78 women and children were killed and 228 women and children wounded. Even by today's standard, in any sort of attack, that's an enormous toll. The country was aghast. We hadn't been attacked on our own soil since, the history buffs will know, or anybody Welsh, since the French arrived in 1790s in Fishguard and got a severe beating from the Welsh. It was just unknown that we would be attacked. We were enormously strong power and the Royal Navy absolutely ruled the seas. And the good people of Scarborough, the houses were wrecked, there was a school shelf, there was a church uh, smashed and sundry others and enormous casualties. In fact, it wasn't the first town hit, uh, the good town of Hartlepool, some miles down the coast where I was brought up, was hit ten minutes earlier with an even larger casualty number. I'm afraid it didn't go up on posters because if in London you'd ever ventured north, the good people of the Hurling Club 
would have gone to take the waters of Scarborough. It was lovely. Bandstand and lovely big hotels, Edwardian splendour. So uh, I can't say the same, I'm afraid, for Hartlepool. <laughs> so we didn't get on the posters. Scarborough was Queen of the North and had been attacked. The effect of this was to galvanise the government and a lot of the general public that life was about to change. This was the 16th of December, just before Christmas. The war was not going to be over. And so, women went into the railways. There were hundreds of hundreds of men who had left for France, eventually tens of thousands from an immense network. This was considered to be slightly worrying as well. A vicar wrote to the Times and said, no, to the Daily Mail this time, wrote to the Daily Mail and said, um, this woman might well be on her own in a remote signal box at night. This is not proper. <laughs> he suggested that an elderly signalman should accompany her. <laughs> he was rebuked by a bishop saying this would be immoral. <laughs> People cared about this sort of thing. It is a very different world. We have forgotten the world where matters of sex, of the relationships between men and women were never discussed, never. Certainly not in polite society or in public. So there she is, the Lady Signalette. They had a lot of problem with the language. And there were others. The trains were being cleaned. This is Bradford. Look, there's another little revolution underway. One of the things that has happened is that the women who come along to clean the trains, to replace the men, crawl into the engine. They had to be cleaned inside as well as out. And it took another two women to get the first ones out because their petticoats and aprons caught on all of the bits of metal in the box and everything. It took ages to extract them. So look what they've done. There is something here. Women have something below the waist called legs. This has not been seen in most people's lives. Women wore skirts to the ground. That was it. This is a revolution, an absolutely staggering revolution. These women were chased down the streets. Small boys threw stones at them. People hurled invective. Old ladies whacked them with umbrellas, shouting hussies, disgraceful, disgraceful. They thought they were absolutely wonderful. They were practical. And here's the start of a massive revolution where women, for the first time, start dressing for work and practicality, not for tradition and convention. And looking around, it's caught on. <laughs> Up in Glasgow, they're a little bit more careful. The long tartan skirt, even then, there were still immense complaints to the tramways department that the lassie would be going upstairs to get the fares and there might be gentlemen riding on the platform below. <laughs> this sort of nagging on about things was not trivial. Everybody felt that life was going topsy-turvy. This was worrying. There was a war being fought, but at the same time, Ordinary daily life seen by everybody on your trams, on your trains, in every place there were women. First time that window cleaning became a spectator sport. <laughs> Tarring the roads. Mind you, if you look in the background, you didn't get to drive the steamroller. <laughs> Down at the gasworks. Oh, these delicate little women, not able. Well, my goodness me, look what they were doing. And they were also in the countryside. Everybody tends to, I go very carefully here, um, everybody tends to think of Downton Abbey kinds of lives. That was for very, very few people. The countryside was poor. There'd been low prices for 40 years before the war because of the cheap imports of food from the empire. Farms were generally 
well, close up, horrible. Ancient, damp, damp rotting buildings, very, very little mechanization, a few threshing engines here and there. The tractor is only just being invented. And in fact, it's being pressed into service two years after the war start as the prototype tank. So there is very little on the countryside other than hard labor, sweat, and mud, mud, mud. First of all, with the farmhands having left to the trenches, they could hardly get any women to go to the countryside. It was not considered idyllic. People knew the drudgery, the cold, the mud, and the dirt. People shuddered. It's so different when you look at our beautiful countryside. This was, of course it was idealized by Victorian painters, but the reality, and for women, was very grim. So only a very few women went to the countryside, and then they were told to wear smocks and gaiters. That is actually the old-fashioned shepherd smock, belted in the middle, and a pair of gaiters underneath. Again, disgraceful. Not the sort of things women should wear. This is where most women wanted to be, in the munitions factories. Munitions factories, which were popping up up and down the country after 18 months after Lloyd George had been appraised of the appalling <coughs> shell scandal, the troops on the front line were running out of shells. Thousands upon thousands of women were heading for the factories, a lot of them out of domestic service. And the cry went up, the servant problem throughout the land, as vast numbers of women all over went to these newly erected factories and some of the old engineering factories. They also went into heavy engineering as well. They were doing the jobs which it was thought no woman could do. They were skilled jobs to be done and semi-skilled jobs and dangerous jobs as well. The dangers were awful. Women lost noses, their faces were damaged. They had hands and fingers blown off, and there were times when entire factory buildings blew up. In Nottingham, in Chilwell, at one vast factory, nobody ever knew how many died because they couldn't find any remains afterwards. This was working with TNT and cordite and picric acid. Picric acid which turned a lot of skin and hair yellow the Canary Girls. Amusing for some, but over a hundred died straight of the poisoning from picric acid. But these girls had two things which made them feel immensely excited. First of all, they got to work with lots of other women, which was an unusual thing, except in a few of the Yorkshire and Lancashire mills. It was thrilling, it was gossip, it was a sense of unity, and you were working for the government. They felt so proud. These were little skivvies and little downstairs maids, and they were absolutely thrilled to be recognized as an official war worker. And they were amongst the very first women ever to be paid directly by the government. Women hadn't qualified for that sort of job ever before. They were thrilled by it. And the second thing is that they were being paid three times what you got as a domestic servant. <gasps> Riches! Well, not quite. It was less than half than the man standing next to them doing the same job was being paid. But it was more, and they were absolutely over the moon. And here we have to mention what is dear to the heart of this club, which is sport. Sport, on the whole, had come to a stop during the war. Um, polo? Well, I'm afraid all the horses have gone. In six weeks, 170,000 horses were sent to France, requisitioned. Hacks, hunters, ordinary stable horses, cart horses to pull the guns, polo ponies, all went to the war effort. <coughs> Um, a couple of months later, the army sent back from France for 170,000 more, and so on, throughout the war. 
Eventually, horses came in from Brazil, Canada, America, in immense horse ships coming across the Atlantic. An extraordinary tale. Uh, the best of which, I think, happened near the Severn Bridge, one of the great remount centers in this country, where some of the polo ponies may have gone, where the good people of Wales looked across the Severn River and said, it looked like Mexico at night. <laughs> Mexico? Well, what they did know was that Mexico had volcanoes. And at night, the piles of horse manure were so high and steamed so much, it turned into a country of volcanoes north of Bristol. It was a war changing everything. Football had been abandoned. The referees, the sidesmen, and the players had joined up. Uh, FA football, the league, had been abandoned. Some of these women worried about their husbands and fathers coming home by then, this is 1915, 1916, badly injured, were very worried about how soldiers were going to be supported. Little welfare, remember. <laughs> Just like Help for Heroes today, they knew that they had to have more money to help the seriously injured coming home. So they thought, what can we do to raise money? This is a photograph from 1917. Three years previously, nobody had seen a woman's legs. Now, revealed to the world, our women have knees. It was, again, a revolution. Women's football teams were formed up and down the country, hundreds of them. They played in front of huge crowds and they charged entrance fees and raised vast amounts for homecoming soldiers. I can't actually say whether men came in order to see the soccer technique or to see the knees. It's not entirely clear. But they were enormously keen. They went on playing after the war, by the way, uh, as help for heroes know. The real demand comes after the war is over to support men. So they went on until the FA realized in 1921 that more men were attending the women's game than the men's game. <laughs> I think it must have been the knees. At which point the FA pronounced that they wouldn't let their grounds be used anymore by these women and they were henceforth banned um, on the basis that football was injurious to those very organs women have been put on earth to use. <laughs> Fascinating. I'm not sure if the FA quite knew what it was talking about, but there you go. Um, you didn't go into detail in those days. And so, 1921, this disappeared from national life. You'd be glad to know that the FA relented in 1993. <laughs> Meanwhile, there were women being asked to join the forces, not to fight. There were women being asked to replace the men in the army who were being pulled forward to the front line to fight, who were clerks, cleaners, um, and uh, cooks. So then again, there was trouble. They were going into real uniforms, long gabardine max. Oh, this is thought very improper. There was great opposition to them and the wrens and the wafts when they were formed. There was a lot of trouble about this. It was thought very unseemly. In fact, initially it was thought that they shouldn't have women officers because, of course, you could never have anybody salute a woman. Dr. Chalmers Watson, who was in charge of the wax, uh, was not amused by this. A forthright woman with a uh, very well connected, and uh, they had worried, actually, that she should be head of the wax because she didn't have a title. This is how people thought in those days. At least, you know, um, a marchioness should have been at the head of the troops. But eventually she got the patronage of Queen Mary, no less. And Dr. Chalmers Watson, made a very revealing little social remark at one point, 
remind, when they started advertising for women to join the army. She was still battling with a lot of old generals who said, oh, you shouldn't have women as officers. No, 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 wrong, wrong. And Thomas Watson uh, sort of said, what is your, your idea sort of based on? And this general looked a bit, general looked a bit doubtful and said, well, um, are these women who are actually going to be enlisted uh, as um, ordinary soldiers, might they be working class women? And Chalmers Watson said, yes, very likely. Good Lord, said the general, and sank into thought. And Chalmers Watson said, so what's wrong? He said, I, I, I've, never, I've never spoken to one of them. <laughs> Makes you think. The divisions of class, the views about propriety, all of these things highlight the change that women were making. They were turning society upside down. Things were very different. And breaking all the rules were a bunch of women who had had the temerity to cross to France. These are the ladies of the first aid nursing yeomanry, still in place today. The first aid nursing yeomanry had a curious history, being invented only a few years before in 1909 by a veteran of the Boer War, who came back knowing that the British Army had a bit of a gap in its systems for getting casualties from the battlefield to the casualty clearing stations and the hospitals. Um, he thought it was a very splendid idea if you were lying on a battlefield, wounded, and what you heard was and a beautiful horse cantered up with a beautiful young lady on it and scooped you up onto the saddle and took you off. I don't know what he was on. <laughs> but he put an advert in the Times of London saying, wanted volunteers for this new force to help with casualties in case of war. A matter of a couple of years later, several, uh, a lot, quite large numbers of women initially turned up and a couple of years later they changed the horses for these jalopies, their ambulances. And in the first few weeks of the war they went to the British Red Cross, offered their services. Good heavens no, said the head of the Red Cross. We don't want women in the war zone. They went to the army, the RAMC. Uh, what do we want you for, they said. You're women. So they offered their services to the French and the Belgians, who said, come now, please. <laughs> they crossed the channel, and they seemed the most extraordinary crowd. They were really rather posh. I mean, no gabardine coats for them. They wore fur coats to go to war. <laughs> that is because they were all frightfully well connected because the last line of the advert in 1909 had somewhat restricted the kind of people who joined. It said, must have own horse. <laughs> Everybody tittered at them. They thought it rather shocking, but also ridiculous that women should head for the sound of the guns, the artillery fire, the ghastly war, which was now fully raging. By the end of the war, the first aid nursing yeomanry had garnered more medals than any other volunteer group during the war. Medals for bravery. They were famous for heading for the firing lines for their casualties and never turning back, ever, until they got their casualties. And one other group was breaking all the rules as well. Again, across the channel in a matter of days, went a group of women led by Louisa on the right. She was a GP. Of course, she'd never been allowed to do surgery and she never had male patients. <gasps> Here she is in Paris on the operating table with her all women's surgical team round her. There is a wounded Belgian soldier. She is operating. He is a man. She writes to her mother, who saw her off at Calais when they left, I feel fulfilled. 
I am doing what I know I should do. And I'm showing that I can do it. Her mother had seen her off, saying, my dear, if I were younger, I would come with, her, with you. Her mother was Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, the first woman in this country, the pioneer to qualify as a woman doctor. This is Louisa Garrett Anderson on the right. She went on to run, and if you ever have a moment around Covent Garden, uh, go and find Endell Street. And there is a little plaque in Endell Street in Covent Garden. And it is the place where the hospital, which was run entirely by women during the war, from surgeons and anaesthetists and nurses to orderlies, porters, everyone was a woman, and it treated 27,500 men during the war and had the highest record for recoveries. Yes. They have broken all the rules. They are doing what they feel they should do, and they are proving what had been thought in 1914 they could not do. This is what these women achieved. I mentioned earlier, women went back to the kitchen pretty well and to their domestic duties pushed back in 1918-19 in an exhausted country to make way for the men. A lot of people thought that they'd been only given their uh, freedom to do all of these different jobs because there was a war on. A lot of people did not want to accept that things should change permanently. But the point was these women at the beginning of the war had been considered incapable of doing jobs. Remember, if they had to take any decisions, their brains are going to boil. They have proved in this terrible war that they can rise to the occasion. And they the absolutely they are the people who laid the foundations for women to assume more responsibility, to come alongside men and to make society a better and fairer society. And I think we should be very grateful for what these women did. Thank you. it then. <laughs> Kate, that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you. And I enjoyed hearing about your early years and your career and then on to the, the stories of these women. And this is only 100 years ago. Amazing, oh. isn't it? How, um, how, how life has changed. So, ladies and gentlemen, two things. The first is, I'm inspired to go and buy the book, which is out there. Kate has signed and will sign um, if you would like to do so um, after, when we, when we leave here. But first, maybe you'd like to ask a question or two. Um, there are some roving mics. I see a gentleman at the back there. Um, it would be really helpful if you could just stand up so the lights have gone on now, so at least we can see you. Thank you. I can't quite hear, because I'm, I'm deaf, actually. Yeah. Yes. Women's, you conclude that women's life... Hmm? Uh, try again. I, yeah, think, you, uh, I yeah. think we can conclude that you are saying that women's lot has improved in the last hundred years. Um, but we all live in England. We know we wander around every day, and we see ladies in long gowns, headscarves, and burkas. Um, obviously, mostly immigrants. Do you believe these ladies are still stuck in 1914? Do you think their lot will improve? And what would you do? Would you ban the burqa? They're not actually in 1914. They're in 1389, I think. <laughs> which is the year uh, which um, uh, designates one particular religion's um, timeline. Um, 
I wouldn't ban anything. What I think we ought to do is insist in this country, because there are so there are complex problems involved here. I feel very strongly that when you have women educated and equal and sharing responsibility as well as reaping the rewards for being part of society that is recognized and valued and uh, treated the same, um, we should do that for all women in Britain. And we should not make exceptions and have women downtrodden and treated as lesser just because of some argument about culture. I feel immensely strongly if they are British citizens, they should be like the rest of us and they should have the opportunities, chances and freedoms to behave and to achieve what they want like the rest of us. And we should insist upon that. And I have yet to discover many women who choose themselves to wear such clothes. They may go through a phase where they have a bit of a revolt against Western society, and that's often the young teenage girls. But I have to say that other arguments as well about having separate schools, lesser schooling, uh, and being confined and not being allowed to behave like teenagers in this country do, for good or ill, but it's growing up, I think all of those girls deserve to be treated like every British citizen. And we have been derelict in our duty of insisting upon that. Something we can do. Thank you. Um, o over, over on my, my left. Oh, and by the way, I wouldn't ban anything. I don't think you can ever ban anything. You know, every headmaster or headmistress who tries to ban something in school finds the whole school wearing it the next day <laughs> because that's what school children do, but, or anybody else. But the point is you don't ban it. I believe very strongly that, and I felt this as a reporter, um, that if I, for example, I'm going to interview for somebody on television, I have to be able to identify them for the audience. That is why I will not, and never did, interview people whose faces you can't identify. I don't think that public transactions and public jobs should be done by people wearing masks, balaclavas, or burkas. Now, for men, if one was to turn up in a balaclava, one would say, take it off, that is improper. The same thing should happen, I think, for women in public, uh, in public exchanges and where identity is important. Consider if you get on a bus and there is a fracas, which does happen. What you do when you get to court and the so-called CCTV images show you, but do not identify someone who is shrouded in black. It is a public transport and if there's CCTV, then we should all be equal in front of it. Yes. Very. These are the practical things which I think we should just argue. I don't want to ban anything. I want to enforce freedoms and equality. I shall, I, I shall now get off my high horse. No, no, no. Yeah. no, no, no. That's well, my name's John Wick. My name's John Wiggum, and I wanted to thank you for a marvellous lecture. Um, you've mentioned Hartlepool and Durham and Endell Street, but I want you to know that in W60AL, there is an AD Street, and I want to know whether that uh, has been christened by you. It's, it's the best street off Hammersmith Grove. And if you haven't been there, I'd be very happy to take you to your own street. <laughs> It is very sweet. I shall take you, actually, to the ancestor of my adoptive family from the Shetlands. Uh, there are three streets together. I think one of them is Beatty. They are admirals in the Royal Navy in the 18th century. And there was an AD. There was an AD. There were several ADs who were at the Battle of the Nile, and two are buried in the Gibraltar Cemetery. That is the family. We come from, or my adopting father's family, come from that tiny box in the corner of the map of the Atlas, right up there. And they are the Aedes, northernmost family in Britain. And should have stayed there, according to a lot of people. 
Now, is there anyone over this side with a question? Yes, thank you. I'd like to know why you don't go into politics. I think you would be fantastic for us. <laughs> well, I've never been party pre. Oh, that's, a, uh, that's a good, safe thing to say in a week like this. Um, the point is, as a reporter, one doesn't. Um, and one doesn't ever sort of say any particular sort of um, uh, adherence or loyalty uh, or whatever. But I, I, I had a career in which I was very conscious that as a reporter, my job was to try and just bring information to people about the rest of the world, about what man did to man. Um, I'm not sure if I'm the sort of person who can argue um, what our law should be or um, such things. I think it takes a certain sort of person to do that. I'm just a noise on side, really. <laughs> um, politics, I have to say, now I will say this, I was filming in the House of Commons last year. It is still like a boys prep school. <laughs> I'm not joking, it is. And it's very uncomfortable. And I know many women MPs. And I think much as I love tradition, and I am so fond of this country, and I, I love, you know, a, a great amount about it in the traditional <coughs> side. But I find the way that the place is conducted looks like a cross between a seedy old club and a prep school. And I don't think that's the place for modern men and women to consider the future of the country. And therefore, there are some things which I find about politics. Even the great building up there are slightly uncomfortable, and I think it's about time we possibly left it to the tourists. <laughs> Kate, wonderful talk, but do tell me, did you ever consider going on the stage? I have to tell you that when I was um, 17 and I left school, I was one of the first people from the north of England who auditioned, and to her amazement, uh, not through, I don't think, any great talent, but they were just hoping a few more people would come from the north of England, joined the National Youth Theatre which is still going today, which um, operates in the summer in London. Um, it's had very varied history and is a real coming together of, of people from all sorts of school, from public school to what was then Borstal. We were a really mixed crowd. And there were a couple of hundred of us um, there. Uh, I only rose to the great heights of being a member of the, um, the crowd in Julius Caesar. <laughs> Um, and, and I was also the assistant wardrobe mistress who had the job of um, darning a to be James Bond's tights <laughs> while they were on him. <laughs> and that's about as far as I got to greatness. And I got on terrifically. I mean, we were an enormous group and we still know each other and we keep in touch. And there's one of them. Um, I think she's done, uh, anyway, name of Mirren. <laughs> and apparently, you know, she got the lead parts and I just didn't, so I mean, who is going to play second fiddle? Well, perhaps we should say thank you, because actually um, we wouldn't have seen you um, on the news bringing us those, those stories. Thank you for this evening. Um, I think uh, your, your tutor was wrong. I think you are a national treasure now. And would you like, ladies and gentlemen, to join with me in thanking Kate Adie.